So hello everyone and thank you for joining the ISP series describing photon and neutron and how large research infrastructure can be tools for innovation. So I'd like to welcome you all and to uh, welcome our uh, wonderful speaker on the, this exciting topic as well, which hopefully will open to a lot of questions. So beginning, uh, so I will first uh, share with you some uh, few words about the ISP and then the biography of uh, our lecture. So just uh, to recall as well that since uh, beginning of May, so the ISP, so the African School of Fundamental Physics and Application has produced almost 60 lectures in the field of theoretical physics, experimental physics and application. So all the recording and more prerequisites so are available on our website, so you, where you will find as well more information about our nonprofit organization. So we especially recall, so the six lectures in part R, A, sorry, uh, so by uh, Professor Andrew Harrison, who introduced synchrotron and neutron-based diffraction and uh, spectroscopy technique. So in uh, this uh, part B, so the first uh, ESS talk, so was given by Dr. Andrew Jackson, who presented neutron as a uh, natural tools uh, for researcher, <clears throat> sorry. The second talk was given by Professor Pascal Dean, introducing so neutron scattering as a tool to understand quantum mechanics, the magnetism as it's done at uh, the ESS. And today we will listen to Dr. <coughs> Sorry, Robin Warak, who will be the third out of four lectures presented by ESX expert. So Robin is an instrument class coordinator for imaging at uh, engineering at uh, the European Spatial Source, and he has a key interest in enabling a broad range of researchers, so from academia to industry, in order to benefit uh, so from the unique capability of large-scale facilities and to create a positive societal, societal impact. So while, uh, um, so and after obtaining his uh, degree in mechanical engineering in Germany, so he worked for the automotive uh, companies and he has experienced a broad range of material and processes that needed to be monitored and in order to improve uh, uh, the, um, this innovation, thanks to material or for material. And in 2006, so Rubin received a Fulbright scholarship and worked in his master degree at the University of T in Tennessee of Knoxville. So in collaboration with General Motors on the characterization of lost form casting processes of aluminum engine blocks. And from 2009, he continued his PhD research at the University of Tennessee in close collaboration with the Helmut Centrum in Berlin and in Oak Ridge National Laboratories and succeeded in establishing diffraction-based contrast mechanism in neutron imaging, so for studies of crystalline material. So Robin joined the ESS in 2015, where he was responsible for the operation of a dedicated neutron test beam line in Berlin, so until 2019, till it closed, and with some hands-on experience and all match on neutron facilities over 10 years. And now he's relocated since March 2020 in Lund, so in Sweden. So today, um, for the logistic of this presentation, so Robin can take the question during his presentation. So you can use as well the chat box or you can wave virtually so that uh, we can, or he can give uh, some answer if it's short or we can keep those questions for the, the end of the talk. So with this uh, introduction, so the screen is yours, uh, Robin. Yeah, thank you very much, Christine. You briefly confirm that you can see the shared screen now. That works. Perfect. Then let's get started. Um, yeah, as you heard, my name is Robin Voracek, and my background is indeed in. Um, I would first of all like really to thank the organizers for this interesting and valuable seminar series. Um, and you should really check out the previous recordings that are all out on YouTube. I highly recommend it. Um, and then also for me to contribute by presenting. Uh, you about how neutrons can be used to reveal structural and microstructural properties inside of engineering materials and components and how they can provide complementary and often unique contrast when you compare them to x-rays, for example. Um, if you should watch this seminar as a recording later, feel free to email me anytime at the address shown on the bottom uh, here and just get in touch. Um, at first, I will recall on the complementary of characterization techniques and the interaction of neutrons with matter. 
And then I will show what kind of different neutral methods can be used to study materials at different length scales. And afterwards, I will show you plenty of example applications, largely focused on neutron imaging, but also some using diffraction and also small angle neutron scattering. After the summary, we hopefully have time for some more questions, but feel free also to interrupt me should you have a question on, on a particular uh, slide. So let's get started. While it's obvious that different characterization techniques exist and are complementary to each other, I still like to show this particular slide as it nicely highlights the need for these complementary techniques to avoid for us being blind without knowing. When we want to investigate an unknown object, our lab methods may tell us one thing, electron microscopy another, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, in order to actually identify this rather large object as an elephant, one needs to exploit a range of techniques. To give you a somewhat more realistic example, let us uh, consider availab available 3D tomography uh, uh, techniques. There's a range of techniques, each one providing a certain level of information over a final length scale. Here you can see an example of atom probe tomography uh, with sub nanometer resolution and of electron and focused ion beam tomography operating on micrometer sized sample volumes. X-ray and synchrotron tomography can investigate larger samples with sub-micrometer resolutions and can, for example, visualize individual grains in polycrystalline samples. Now, neutron tomography offers spatial resolution starting beyond one micrometer, but allows to study much larger samples. In particular, it allows to extend the information about atomic, atomistic properties towards a meso and macro scale. While the previous seminars of this series, uh, those particularly held by Andrew Harrison and Andrew Jackson already covered the basics of neutron interactions with matter, I like to recap them here one more time. Neutrons interact with the nucleus of an atom, unlike light or X-rays that interact with the electron cloud. You can imagine the nucleus to be the size of a marble and then the atom being the size of a football stadium. As a result, as a result, neutrons interact with your sample only when they hit the nucleus. <clears throat> and as a result of this, then again, neutrons can penetrate, for example, the thick lead container and, for example, reveal the flowers inside of it. As you will see in several examples later on, neutrons and X-rays are highly complementary. Here are some radiographs of a model airplane, engine, and also a bullet. A very useful thing to look at when you want to decide if neutrons might be useful for you is this type of periodic table that compares attenuation for neutrons versus X-rays. And uh, these tables or the information from these tables, Christine can maybe upload on the website later as well. So for X-rays, we have a proportional, proportional dependency on the elemental number, while for neutrons, the interaction appears rather unsystematic. And the interactions are even different for uh, different isotopes of the same element. What you may not have seen in some of the earlier seminars, however, is that this attenuation, or more generally speaking, the cross-section, also depends on the energy of the radiation. This is true for X-rays and for neutrons, and of course, one can make use of this during experimental investigation. The total neutron cross-section describes the observed attenuation by a material and it depends on different scattering contributions as well as absorption. The scattering contributions can then furthermore be subdivided into elastic coherent, inelastic coherent, elastic incoherent, and inelastic incoherent scattering. Uh, next, I would now like to show you uh, which neutron-based techniques can actually be used to study materials at different length scales. At ESS, we will have a suit of instruments that will offer the most common neutron techniques shortly after we start operating the facility. Here you can see a very rough range of length scales on the x-axis. And if you are interested in the atomic structure and or the magnetic structure of materials, then atomic lattice spacings on the angstrom range on the angstrom regime can be probed by a neutron diffraction where neut while neutron refractometry is a very powerful technique to investigate surface and interface structures on length scales ranging from the sub nanometer up to several hundreds of nanometers. In one of the last seminars, uh, my colleague Andrew Jackson already explained a little bit about small angle neutron scattering, which can be used to study all sorts of substances of uh, substances on similar length scales as refractometry, 
between one nanometer and up to a few hundred nanometers. The length scale can further be extended uh, towards a micrometer range by using very small and ultra small angle neutron scattering. All of these scattering measurements are performed in reciprocal space or Fourier space, while neutron imaging on the other hand is actually performed in real space and the accessible length scales are determined by the achievable spatial resolution of the instrument, which nowadays is as good as a few micrometers. And of course, neutrons can shine through tens of centimeters of material. Moreover, scattering techniques usually uh, probe average volumes of the material, while imaging is a spatial resolve technique, as I just explained. So let us consider metallic materials, or generally speaking, crystalline structures for a moment. Polycrystalline materials are composed of many individual grains, and their structure, orientation, and defects inside uh, determine the overall properties of the material we are later using. These properties range from the atomic angstrom scale up to the macro scale, which uh, is then up to several millimeters. Neutron methods, as you have seen on the previous slide, can access all of these length scales. So as such, you can, for example, use small angle neutron scattering to study precipitates, certain porosities, and crack sizes, or diffraction to study internal stresses, crystalline phases, and texture. Traditional neutron imaging can only really reveal features down to just below 10 micrometers, whereas advanced neutron imaging exploit different scattering mechanisms and is essentially sensitive to all these length scales. And I will show you this with uh, examples later on. The first round of examples that I like to show you simply exploits the attenuated or shadow image that is recorded in neutron imaging. I would like to start out by showing you short examples to showcase where neutron imaging can be extremely useful. Most applications actually exploit simply the attenuation differences between different elements and isotopes. As such, one can study the water uptake in this root soil system of a plant, for example, and in the 3D uh, images, you actually see this is a time series of 3D tomographies, and you can see the water uptake inside of the system. Uh, the method can also be used to reveal hydrogen that is causing embrittlement in metals. And another popular application is to look at lithium transport in batteries. And due to its non-destructive nature, neutron imaging has been extremely successful for cultural heritage applications. You can see, for example, a lead statue. And since the lead can be easily penetrated by the neutrons, one can reveal the inner wooden kernel and moreover, even locate regions that have been soldered or corroded inside of the statue. Applications, of course, also exist in the medical sector. Here you can see, for example, uh, some examples of bone structures and implants. And of course, one can look at complete assemblies like uh, this example of a diesel particle filter. I will now pick out a few of these examples in some more detail and some additional ones um, on the next slides. Uh, okay, but this guy is stopping me as he would like to know a little bit more about the neutron imaging setup. So let's try that. So if you have ever wondered how an image is actually formed as a snapshot of reality, so the images you would normally take with your camera or possibly smartphone these days captures the visible light, which is reflected by the objects in the direction where you're aiming the camera. And the camera principally consists of a black box and an optical lens. So if we want to record an image of, let's say, Homer Simpson, for example, then the reflected light is projected through the lens onto the CCD ship, or film in the old days, placed on the backside of this black box. And then we obtain an upside down image of Homer. But how about if you want to now record images using neutron rays instead of light rays? The most important thing here is that neutrons are not as easy to focus as visible light uh, or X-ray beams, which means there are no efficient optics to make images with a comparable resolution to state-of-the-art X-ray images or optical microscopy. If you like, I have a little pop-up quiz here. I'm not sure if there are any takers. So how would one record an image of Homer without any optics using visible light? I'm sure if anybody wants to answer. And you've probably heard of this. Um, it's called a, a pinhole camera or a camera obscura. So we would put a small pinhole there. 
which will then produce an image on the wall inside of the box. In this example now, you can also see that the size of the pinhole will influence the spatial resolution of the image. The larger the pinhole, the more light comes in, but the blurrier the image. So we have just seen how to create an image of the surface of an object with visible light. But if you want to investigate the internal structure, we need to look, of course, inside the objects. And for that, we can use X-rays or neutrons. You know this already, of course, when you use X-rays, you can get images of your body, for example, where only part of the beam passes through. We will observe the transmission image, which is also called a radiograph, on the detector placed behind this hand. Now you can, of course, also do that with neutrons. If you have a neutron source, and the neutron source is usually always a point source of radiation. And in order to record an image of Homer, and since we do not have efficient optics, we need to put a pinhole that will determine the resolution and the exposure time of our image. And this, as a matter of fact, is exactly how a neutron imaging experiment is being performed. Neutrons are coming from a neutron source, which is usually a research reactor or a spallation target, and the direction towards the object is defined by a collimator. The sample can then be positioned and rotated for tomography. The detector is placed in the direct beam behind the sample and records the shadow image of the object under investigation and possibly also the time of arrival of the neutrons. So let us assume we now want to take a radiograph of the sample that is made from two different materials and has a variant thickness. <clears throat> so what will we see? Well, the neutron beam travels along the beam direction Z with an incident de uh, intensity denoted as I0 here. And the transmitted intensity on the detector I is then defined by what we call the beer lombard law. Besides the incident intensity, it depends on the attenuation coefficient mu and the thickness of the sample Z. So now let's assume we have one centimeter of material with an attenuation coefficient of one. This means that of the 100% intensity I0, only 37% would be left on the other side. And if it now passes through two centimeters of material, then only 13.5% of the initial beam intensity would be left. The thicker part of the yellow material will hence appear darker than the thinner part. And how about the attenuation from the blue material compared to the attenuation from the yellow parts? Well, its transmission depends again on the attenuation coefficient mu which is material specific. And this you can look up on this, these tables that I've shown you before, these periodic tables. So let's assume it's 0.8 for the blue material, in which case we will measure a beam intensity of 45%. The attenuation coefficient for material depends on the probability that the neutron is removed from the direct beam. And as I explained earlier, it can be removed by one of two processes, absorption or scattering. And the total attenuation is the sum of neutron attenuation from these types of processes inside the material. I believe this was also covered in the previous lectures. Okay, now let's move on to some more uh, examples. What can we actually do with this? And because neutrons have this really great penetration powers, they are of course an ideal, ideal tool to look at civil engineering structures. Here's an example of a reinforced concrete with a steel bar. And then uh, colleagues uh, at the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, they perform neutron tomography, and that allows them to separate the different components inside, of, uh, inside and also to reveal and visualize corroded areas around the steel rod, for example. And all of this is then non-destructively, of course. Uh, uh, this example now that I'd like to show showcases another civil engineering application that was motivated to study the effect of fire in buildings. The study was done at the new image, fairly new imaging in, instrument at the ILL in Grenoble, France, where researchers from the University of Grenoble are doing pretty exciting experiments, particularly in the field of geomechanics. When concrete is exposed to very high temperatures, it is prone to a process called spalling, which means that layers are ejected. And moisture inside the concrete is a driving factor of this process, which is a very heterogeneous process as well. And in order to study this, they heated concrete to about 500 degrees Celsius inside the sample environment that you can see here, and then collected a series of tomographies in operando during the process, each one taking about one minute. And here you can see now the water 
front and how it dries, allowing to monitor the speed of this drying front. And then they did this for different types of concrete. And what this graph on the top right shows is that the temperature profile is identical between different types of concrete, but that the drying profile is actually quite different. Besides gaining an improved understanding of the process itself, the colleagues were also able to verify an hypothesis related to an accumulation of moisture, moisture ahead of the front, which eventually is responsible for a pressure buildup that can result in the spalling of the concrete and in the worst case can then cause collapse of full buildings. Uh, this example you have already shown in brief before, and there are a lot of different applications in the automotive sector where neutrons and particular neutron imaging is useful due to its high penetration power in combination with its unique contrast. This is an industrial example also done at the PSI where they have looked at diesel particle filters and the elemental sensitivity of neutron tomography has allowed them to separate the distribution of soot and ash as well, of, as well as of metal particle filters inside of this component. I would now like to show uh, some examples where neutron imaging has been used to optimize production processes of lithium ion pouch batteries. Pouch batteries are very widely used because they make the most efficient use of space and achieve 90 to 95% packing efficiency. In the manufacturing of these lithium ion battery cells, the filling with liquid electrolyte is a very crucial step in terms of product quality and cost. And while the actual filling process takes only a few seconds, battery manufacturers often wait several hours to ensure the liquid is fully absorbed in the pores of the electrode stack. The colleagues from the Technical University of Munich at their neutron source have applied neutron imaging to study this filling process under different process parameters as the hydrogen of the electrolyte is highly visible for neutrons, while the housing is almost transparent. Here you can see the experimental setup that allowed them to visualize the soaking behavior of the electrolyte liquid inside. And this is then an example of a non-ideal filling process where the middle of the cell actually remained unvetted. And in contrast, you can see here a good example of a filling process. The study allowed them to gain insight into the influence of the process parameters so that the production process could be optimized, leading overall to a more stable cell performance and cost reduction due to the faster processes and lower scrap rates in the manufacturing process. Now, um, I would actually like to show you another battery example that has pushed the boundaries of the experimental possibilities even a little bit further. This example is from a study performed by colleagues from the University College London together with researchers from the Helmholtz Centrum Berlin and uh, the ILL. And they looked at commercially batteries based on, manganese, uh, on a manganese oxide electrode. The study exploited simultaneous X-ray and neutron imaging. And this modality is currently possible, for example, at beam lines at the ILL, at PSI, and also at NIST in the US. And we also plan to have this option at ESS early on on our imaging beamline Odin. The big challenge here really lies in investigating the lithium distribution and the change of the Kessop anode structure inside this wall battery assembly. And to overcome this, the colleagues employed a virtual unrolling technique that uh, allows to follow the local contrast changes more easily, and in particular to follow now the lithium intercalation at different stages. And here you can see three different discharging stages, uh, states. And if you take a segment of the battery and unroll it, then you can see here what happens with the electrodes, both with X-rays seen on top here and with neutrons seen on the bottom. For X-rays, we don't have really contrast for the lithium, but we see very clearly the expansion of the mangan oxide electrode during the discharging, which is depicted on the Y-axis here for seven different discharge states. For neutrons, we have a strong contrast from lithium because it absorbs neutrons rather strongly. For instance, you can see the diffusion of lithium inside the mangan oxide electrode. This example, I think, illustrates that the complementary of the two tomographies is capable of providing a much more complete picture of the processes inside a, a battery under operation than if only one imaging modality would be used. Another example by the same research group shows an operating battery during this charging. In this case, tomographies were done every seven, and a, every seven and a half minutes to monitor the internal processes in 3D. And on the top left, you see one slice through the center of the battery 
and how the electrolyte level is changing. You can also see how the lithium diffusion is happening, showing up in yellow. With this example, you not only see nice images now that reveal, for example, production artifacts, but also allow to quantify, for example, the electrolyte consumption. Now I'd like to switch uh, gears a little bit. Uh, we are now dealing with a metallic sample and neutrons are often used to complement the more standard metallographic characterization techniques. And hydrogen embrittlement is, is a field that is a tremendous problem that hinders us as a society to develop and deploy stronger metallic alloys. Prominent failures related to hydrogen embrittlement include those of bridges and oil platforms, for example. In the example that I'm showing here, colleagues from the BAM in Germany have excessively charged an iron sample with hydrogen up to a point where already blisters were formed. Then they, they performed tomography um, at the research reactor in Berlin that took about 10 hours each. And what you can see here now is the rendered surface uh, with blisters. And now you can look actually inside the sample where you can see cracks in blue and hydrogen in red. Most of the cracks were actually filled with hydrogen, except some of the cracks closer to the surface. And by heating the sample, they could easily release the hydrogen without altering the structure. And between that, then you have, of course, a different attenuation. And this can then be used to even quantify the amount of hydrogen and the pressure inside the bubbles from this data. I should add, however, here that the amount of hydrogen in this example was very large. And because embrittlement can be caused by just very tiny amounts of hydrogen, uh, we as a community are actually working very hard towards increasing the sensitivity of the methods towards much smaller amounts of hydrogen. So if we stick with metallic materials or generally speaking crystalline structures for another moment. Um, so the previous example has shown that we can see the rather large cracks of the metallic sample that you can see here. But how if you want now to study smaller uh, features like these precipitates, for example, or derive information about the crystalline phase or texture, then the normal attenuation imaging that I've just shown you won't be able to resolve this. These properties range from atomic or angstrom scale up to the macro scale, which means up to several, up to millimeters. Neutron methods, as you have seen on the previous slides, can however access all of these length scales. So remember what I've shown you before, that we also have small angle neutron scattering and diffraction in our toolbox to access these smaller length scales. And I will underline this now with a couple of further uh, examples. In this first example, researchers from the KTH in Stockholm have studied an iron chromium alloy and then systematically exploited the complementary between different characterization techniques, uh, namely atom probe tomography, transmission electron microscopy, and small angle neutron scattering. Different heat treatments, for example, produce different microstructures with different phase separations in this alloy. And the transmission electron microscopy can show this in great detail, what you see on the slide, but only over very small sample areas. What you see here is chromium in red and iron in blue. And small angle neutron scattering now, on the other hand, can provide representative sample vo sampling volumes, so much bigger samples. And when fitting the data, one obtains the average size distribution in there. And what is moreover really an intrinsic advantage of using uh, neutrons is the fact that this can be performed in situ and in operando, especially if you've ever prepared samples for TEM, you know how cumbersome that can be. So how about actually internal mechanical stresses in engineering materials? As you may know, mechanical stress is a force per unit cell. And in continuum mechanics, we say residual stress is the expression for the internal forces that neighboring particles of a continuous material exert on each other. And there can be residual stresses that we don't want to have because they have negative implications and also those that are actually quite beneficial. It seems now obvious that good characterization of these internal stresses is essential. And if you want to gain information about the atomic lattice structures, we can employ diffraction. So how does diffraction actually work? 
So if we shoot monochromatic neutrons at a polycrystalline sample, some neutrons scatter according to Bragg's law and certain angles. This angle and the wavelengths of the neutrons can of course be recorded. By choosing another wavelength, it will result in another angle. And by doing this, you can then obtain a full diffractogram like you would, for example, do on your laboratory-based X-ray system. Since we measure now the position of these Bragg peaks with a high accuracy, we can use them to quantify internal strain and stress inside uh, of materials. And if there's a uniform strain, that means that the Bragg peak will simply move. And if there's non-uniform strain, then we also have additional peak broadening. The lattice spacing now inside the material actually then act as internal strain gauges, and one can simply infer residual strain or applied strain from comparing the measured despacing with the reference despacing in the unstressed state called D0. And this can be done by X-ray diffraction, of course, and uh, of course as well. And here again, when using neutrons for this, it's very useful if you want to investigate the bulk structure of materials. And you can see it done by practice. It's the same technique done with lab X-ray, synchrotron X-rays and neutrons. And what it also means in practice that you have different gauge volumes. So the volume you're actually probing is different in size and, uh, and geometry. And you, then you can map out, for example, complete railway tracks and obtain these residual stress maps of, of railways and look where there has maybe a damage occurred. Or you can study and optimize welding parameters and you can even bring a welding machine to a beam line and, and do this sort of in situ or uh, however you wish. One can also, um, one can not only study residual stress but also applied stress, of course. And what's important here since metallic often uh, and what is important here is, since metallic alloys often behave very anisotropic, uh, neutron and X-ray uh, diffraction is extensive, extensively being used to determine lattice-specific elastic constants under tensor loading, for example, and with that to validate and develop deformation models. When we look uh, at this graph here, especially modern alloys that have a good combination of strength and ductility, often consist of multiple phases and are and are fairly complex systems. In at the ESS and also at other engineering uh, diffractometers, uh, primarily at spallation sources, um, we will have uh, there are setups like this with um, diffraction detectors at plus minus ninety degrees. And if we perform a tensile test, so this green sample you can envision being a tensile sample, and if we pull on it, then with diffraction detector one, we obtain uh, the poison strain from one detector. And the other detector actually measures the strain component in along the axial direction. So you're getting two strain directions simultaneously in one measurement by using these two detectors. And if you have this kind of setup and you do loading and cyclic loading, you can then, for example, study the internal residual strain buildup uh, during the cycling loading experiment, and you can extract vast amounts of information from this about your about your system. And as I said, since neutrons are so ideal for non destructing for non destructive testing of in situ processes, one can, for example, install a gleeble on the beamline to simulate complex thermomechanical processes while doing the measurements and what you see here. Finally, I'd like to show you how advanced neutron imaging can be used to obtain information about smaller length scales. And once again, coming now back to the slide, what we haven't really talked about is the fact that almost all materials are actually rather strong neutron scatterers rather than absorbers. Uh, that is, after all, why neutron scattering is so successful. And only a very few materials are actually really neutron absorbers. Among them are gadolinium, borom, cadmium, and lithium. This also means that the information about the missing scattered intensity is embedded in the attenuation signal. And in this regard, uh, it's worth highlighting that the neutron imaging community has really succeeded in past 
years in exploiting these scattering mechanisms for advanced imaging methods, essentially expanding the imaging regime towards domains that were so far addressed by scattering techniques only. And then that allows us really, for example, to exploit diffraction contrast to obtain images of strain distributions in metals. What you see here are some fasteners in two, in two plates, or to obtain local information about crystalline structures in Viking swords, for example. And one can follow phase transitions, for example, in metallic alloys or in energy devices such as solid oxide fuel cells. And one can also explore, exploit phase contrast to reveal internal lattice defects in metals or to visualize magnetic domains. This can then be used, for example, to study and optimize electrical steel used in electric motors. And due to the fact that neutrons have a nuclear spin and a magnetic moment, one can also exploit this for imaging of magnetic fields. I will now um, mostly focus on uh, diffraction contrast in neutron imaging and show you some more detailed examples of that. The method itself is often termed also bracket imaging and in order to understand the examples, I will first briefly explain how it works. So we record the transmitted neutron beam uh, with a wavelength resolution. And what we are mainly interested in is the Bragg diffraction from crystal, uh, from crystal lattices which is based on the elastic coherence, which is based on elastic coherence scattering, which is one of the contributions to the total cross section. Like I've shown you before, if you shoot monochromatic neutrons at a polycrystalline sample, some neutrons scatter according to Bragg's law in a certain angle. And this is what we usually detect uh, in diffraction methods. If we now increase the wavelengths more to being two times the D spacing, then the scattering angle two theta becomes 180 degrees, which means we have backscattering towards our neutron source. And if we now use any larger wavelengths, increase the wavelengths even more, then Bragg's law cannot be fulfilled any longer for this particular HKL lattice plane family. And we see a sharp increase in transmission. And this is a so-called Bragg edge. You may wonder if this would not also work with X-rays, uh, since X-rays and neutrons are doing the same thing. The limitation with X-rays is at the energies this would happen, uh, new, uh, the X-rays couldn't penetrate the material anymore that is of interest, so you wouldn't have any transmission actually. So you cannot do this breakage imaging um, with, with X-rays. And I'd like to take this opportunity to also uh, talk briefly about time of flight, what we typically do at spallation sources. So this wavelength selection that I've just shown can be done by a monochromator at a, what is typically done at a neutron reactor source. And at a spallation source, one typically exploits a time of flight technique. So I will briefly explain the principle here. So let's not yet place uh, the sample in front of the detector and neutrons of all wavelengths start at the origin at time zero that you can see here. So lambda one and lambda two. And then they travel towards the detector and they are separated by their velocity. Neutrons of short wavelengths arrive first and those with long wavelengths arrive later. The detector then records the incident neutron spectrum of your neutron source that you can see here. Now, if we place again a polycrystalline sample in front of the detector, then Bragg diffraction occurs just like it did in the example before. And we obtain the spectrum in every neutron pulse. And if you have a pixelated detector, you get this spectrum in every pixel. Now coming to an example application where we investigated a multi-phase steel that has a good combination of strength and elongation and we used a, this is a metastable austenitic stainless steels that exhibits a so-called transformation induced plasticity or trip effect. And it is widely used because of its good formability. And austenite and martensite are the two phases and they are, can be actually well separated in the neutron transmission spectrum due to well separated and strong break edges that you can see here. So 
This all sounds very great, like we have a killer method, but life is never perfect. One main challenge here lies in the fact that since many crystalline properties are directional dependent, as I told you before, a three-dimensional reconstruction is not always possible. And this not only concerns neutrons, of course, but also electrons or X-ray methods. If the sample, however, has grains that are almost randomly oriented, in other words, texture-free, then non-tensorial properties, such as phase fractions, like I will show you, can be reconstructed by common tomographic reconstruction methods, such as a widely utilized filtered back projection algorithm. So in this experiment that I'd like to show you, we deformed a trip steel with a rectangular cross-section in torsion, so by twisting the sample. And in the elastic deformation regime, the highest strain occurs in the middle of the long sides. But once we start to plastically deform the sample, the geometry is, of course, also altered. So let's start the deformation and we monitor the surface strains by digital image correlation seen in the top center. And you can also see a finite element model of the sample showing the von Mises stresses uh, in the top bottom. Then the load frame that we custom built, it allows for tomography under load. So we can now follow the phase transformation from austenite to martensite at different deformation states. 3D images that you see here are the ratio of tomographic reconstructions and wavelengths before and after the last breakage, noted as lambda 2 and lambda 1 here in, in the graph in the center. And as I said uh, before, so far this evolution was based on this, this ratio of the attenuation coefficient before and after the breakage. But more recently, we and also other colleagues have established spectral neutron tomography for such studies where tomographic reconstruction are done for a series of wavelengths. So you end up with a four-dimensional data set. This now allows you to plot the wavelengths dependent attenuation coefficients for every voxel. Here, uh, one where the sample is fully austenitic. And here's another voxel uh, where significant martensitic transformation has occurred. What is now really cool about this, about this is, is that we can perform the fitting of these break edges on a voxel by voxel basis, and then obtain an improved quantification of the phase fractions than previously possible. So you see these methods are constantly being uh, further developed. Um, and then one also needs real applications to drive these development efforts. And that's something that is that I really enjoy uh, bringing in new applications and getting something useful out of it and pushing the methods uh, further and further. As um, one of the last examples, I'd like to show you how we were able to reveal local strain and texture differences within additively manufactured samples. Additive manufacturing, in particular metal additive manufacturing, is promising for many sectors because it allows complex designs that cannot be achieved with conventional manufacturing methods. Most additive manufacturing processes are based on a layer by layer approach. And among the different methods, selective laser melting is possibly the most matured. Selective laser meal melting deals with small melt pools and fairly high cooling rates. And these can then in turn lead to uh, texture and generally anisotropic properties. Just to briefly mention what means texture, to those of you maybe not familiar with it, if we say a sample is textured, what we mean is that many of the crystalline grains are aligned along the same direction. And this typically happens uh, in processes such as rolling or deep drawing. So really uh, processes that are used to produce things that, that we use in daily life. In this first study now, we looked at residual stresses in selective laser melted stainless steel samples. And one method to tackle problematic residual stresses um, in, in components in general is laser shock peening, where beneficial compressive residual stresses can actually be introduced by this laser shock peening process. And we then applied neutron diffraction contrast imaging with a goal to obtain full field residual stress images. 
And we did this at the JPARC neutron spallation source in Japan. And we obtained the spectra with very nice break edges and we determined the position for uh, every pixel. And these images can then be used to evaluate the strain distribution and how it changed due to the laser shock beating process, allowing basically to optimize the process par parameters of this. So you have a quick methods to access uh, what you have done uh, beforehand. In this example now, we again looked at uh, selective laser melted stainless steel samples. And my colleagues from ESS and Uppsala University, they previously used neutron diffraction to look at textures of these SLM samples. And they made samples with three different scan strategies, meaning the laser moved along the Z direction, along the Y direction, and then it was rotated during the build process. What they have shown is that the texture can actually be controlled by this laser movement, how the laser is scanned. And for instance, we have a strong 110 texture parallel to the laser direction. And we have a strong 110 texture parallel to the building direction. And the rotation scan then resulted in a typical fiber texture. What the colleagues have done next is then they did tensile testing where the tensile axis was along the Z direction. So they made several tensile samples and tested it. And what you see is a stress strain curve. And you can see that there's large differences in ductility, but also in yield strengths. And what this basically means is that the mechanical properties can be tuned and are dependent on the SLM printing parameters or the laser scan strategy in particular. What we then did, we performed wavelength selective neutron imaging on these samples. And the spectra uh, for the samples oriented at zero degrees is what you see here. So the sample is oriented what we term zero degrees. They show a strong two to zero break edge for the Z and the rotation scan. And the one, one, one break edge is rather weak for the Z and for the Z scan and actually absent for the rotation scan. If you look in these pole figures on the bottom, uh, you can see the corresponding pole indicated with a circle that is actually probed by the imaging uh, and the, this orientation of the, of the imaging. And if we rotate now the sample in imaging by 90 degrees, the two to zero bracket is actually strong for the Z scan and weaker for the rotation scan. The so one, one, one bracket on the other hand is weak for the Z scan and strong for the rotation scan. Always also look in the pole figures on the bottom here. By looking at the imaging data and the corresponding spectra and the pole figures obtained by diffraction, we can conclude that the imaging data is very much consistent with the neutron pole figures. And having access to both of this data is, is extremely powerful. And that's probably one of the reasons uh, neutron instruments are being built that are combining imaging with diffraction and possibly also small angle scattering all in one instrument uh, that you can do this all together. And moreover, in this particular study, uh, through a collaboration with colleagues in, in Tennessee, we obtained simulated transmission maps. And we used the neutron pole figures here as input parameters from which we then obtained the transmission intensity in that there's this color scheme here between purple and, and red. Red means the transmission is one, so there's no sample in the beam basically. Um, and this is uh, shown as a function of wavelengths on the X axis and sample rotation on the Y axis. And here you can actually now see it overlaid with our experimental data when the sample is at 90 degrees. And on the bottom, you can see it actually at zero degrees. And again, we see a very good agreement between our experiment and the simulation. And we have simulated it for much more rotation angles that we were actually able to measure. Moreover, in this data set, we also observed local differences within the samples. In particular, for the sample with a Z scan strategy, there are three different areas, bright and dark bands and overlap regions. 
So um, why do we actually see these variations with a two and a half millimeter spacing? The answer is that the laser moved in the Z direction for only five millimeters at a time, completed the width of the sample, and then printed another five millimeter. Every second layer, however, was printed with a two and a half millimeter shift. So looking now into these regions, we can see that there are local textual differences because these spectra, these transmission spectra look different in these different regions. So from this, it should be obvious that these local variations would easily remain undetected without the use of, of neutron imaging. And then we used EBSD to investigate these regions further. So this actually to the involved colleagues was totally surprising that we saw these lines at all. And using now electron backscatter diffraction, think about uh, the picture I showed you in the beginning of the elephant again, uh, to really complement the picture and understand what's going on, we now see that the grains inside these different bends have a slightly different orientation and also a slightly different sharpness of the texture. And this we were able to review with EBSD and relate this to the neutron results. And then again, the neutrons uh, compared to EBSD are very powerful for in situ studies. So finally, we did in situ tensile testing of these samples. And here you can see a sample built with a Z-scan strategy being loaded in tension. So you should watch the region in the red rectangle and how it changes the gray value. And what we observe here is a grain rotation and reorientation inside this area. And then this ultimate failure, when the sample actually breaks, we are actually able to track this back that this is happening in between uh, these overlap regions. So this laser scan strategy, strategy uh, creates this overlap region basically, and that somehow is the weakest spot uh, where the sample will actually break later on. And this we would have not seen otherwise. Okay, I think this is, I already, this is a duplicate somehow, so I will move on and already going to the summary uh, slide. And I will wrap up uh, with, with a brief summary. So first of all, I would like to conclude and encourage you to use neutrons because they are a non-destructive probe of structures and properties ranging between atomic and um, macroscopic scale in the macroscopic scale. And they are especially sensitive to light elements. And with this presentation, I could hopefully show you that neutron imaging can help you to reveal features that will otherwise remain undetected. And there are a lot of advanced techniques and especially here at ESS, we will be able to perform unprecedented in situ and in operando studies. So I like to thank all of you for listening and for tuning in. And if you'd like to know more, check of course out the seminars from the series, uh, both on the, from the website and you can also find them on YouTube. And as I said in the beginning, I really recommend that. There are some really enjoyable lectures there. And also I like to point out there are some other online, uh, other videos online from this Accelerate program. And some of my colleagues presented there um, about the nanoscale to microstructural analysis, uh, in particular by small angle neutron scattering and also about neutron protein crystallography. So with that, I'm open to any questions that you may have. And as I said, should you watch it as a recording, but also those who are in here now, uh, feel free to email me at any time. So thank you very much, Robin, for this uh, complete presentation. So do we have any questions from the audience? Martin is thanking you. So while uh, you are thinking on some question, maybe I can also build up some because I'm really curious to see as well all those simple environment as well that you are setting up as well for the ESS. So 
if we think about the different equipment that you had been using as well in uh, in Germany in the, the Helmut Center, so is there any equivalent equipment and uh, setup uh, that will be used at TSS? Uh, here in particular, what we did is um, well, we we mainly used uh, temperature like furnaces and um, and this and we did in situ loading. And so we are having, we are, we will have some stress rigs at the ESS and possibly even the one that I've shown that allows the sample rotation inside. So we definitely plan to have these capabilities at ESS. And it's probably worth highlighting that there's a strong collaboration across mm -hmm. the different neutron sources and even come up with some standardized sample uh, environments that users can bring their samples to and do, can actually tensile test, for example, the same samples at different facilities. So absolutely. And um, yeah, I think they are often key to enable, um, to enable key, key measurements and key progress in, in the field to having these dedicated sample environments. Yeah, I guess it, it's just like difficult to reproduce exactly the same type of environment. So that's uh, a lot depending on maybe the beam line itself, but it's complementary definitely. Yeah, but I will, I mean, we are typically working that we have similar interfaces, for example, or with small modifications that you can hold uh, similar samples. Um, mm -hmm. For example, for one of the studies, we have done experiment at the ISIS spallation source and the JPAC spallation source, and we are using same sample designs uh, for the corresponding sample environments. Maybe by use of some adapters we had to make, but generally it, it fits. So any question, maybe Granham, do you have any question? And yeah. So so you are working on uh, in in diamond or is it with X-ray or, or rather with neutron? If I can dare asking. We cannot really hear you. So the sound is not good. Huh? I actually don't see the shed function anymore. So I don't know if anything has appeared. You would see it, Christine. Uh, it, it's uh, it's not. Yeah. So so this is why I don't know if uh, there is a, a try to communicate. But the chat is uh, it, it, there is no specific question. So then um, so if we think also about what. One good example as well that you gave was about this uh, this uh, reconstruction with the, the tomographic, the kind of uh, way of uh, simulating and as well making uh, your measurements. So from that, how much was it or would it be possible potentially with uh, machine learning or finding ways as well of um, having a, a smart way of getting your, those image already predefined to analyze and to get as well some um, better understanding in uh, this reconstruction, because it's quite interesting with 3D to build up uh, and to, to try to make some model. And uh, a 3D model takes a lot of, uh, of uh, computing capacity. So maybe machine learning could be as well a way to, to simplify it. Yeah, especially in the touch? field, if there are, if, if you want to do some quantification on series of data sets, um, I know, for example, um, people working on carbon fiber materials, like they need to, they train softwares to identify, to, to quantify diameters of these carbon fibers and have the software learn and adapt to, and then come up with a quantification of these structures that they are revealing. And that is a field that has really recently really been picked up with these artificial intelligence. Uh, software routines. Uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been done anything since the method itself or many of the methods I've shown are fairly new in itself. Um, the analysis is somewhat behind and that is currently also one of the main challenges is to deal with these data sets. Um, you need to have the computing infrastructure with you to actually analyze the data and 
that's also one of the reasons that ESS we have established this data management center, uh, a dedicated data management center, which is located in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. And other facilities are very much following similar approaches. For example, we not only have instrument scientists, but there are also no data instrument scientists who are focusing in particular on the data aspect of, of the experiments. Yeah, the, the big data, because indeed with the, the tomography, that would be very inapplicable, no? very important and useful. So, so indeed to recognize automatically instead of having some simulation where you need really to have all the, the different physics to be implemented to have a good simulation, and then you can uh, try to compare and, uh, and get a better um, result or, or reduce the error. So then from uh, the, um, from, from GM as please, well. I have one question. Bro. Wonderful, please, please go ahead. Huh? Yes. Fabian, go ahead. Please, both. Uh, yes. Uh, I want to know if the neutrons have the same properties in the accelerator, like muons or pions. So the, the property of, uh, uh, so if for instance, we would have a beam of, of, of pion, you mean? Of yes, sir. If, 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 for example, uh, in the LHC, for example, mm -hmm. when you run, when, when you run particle like, like neutrons, could, could we have a lot of optical photon, like secondary particle, like we could get uh, the same, the same range, like the, the, the same range when we when we run the uh, the muons like primary particles, for example. So in indeed, so I don't know, Robin. Do you see the question? The point is really with if you think that you are a high energy physicist, all those different particles. Exactly. Voilà. If we think neutron. And indeed, uh, for, for getting at the, the, the particles level, so it would be similar characteristic. Exactly, sir. So I had uh, some problems understanding acoustically is a question um, just so, about the different types of particles or radiation. Um, I, I, as a general remark, I mean, I, they all have some slightly different properties, but in that's why the different types of radiation are exploited and are often very highly complementary. Um, for example, one place that does that particular well is Los Alamos National Laboratory, where they also do, for example, proton tomography. So they, um, so they have really different types of, of, of beams, uh, or also use gamma uh, irradiation and so on, and uh, do basically um, in, uh, for example, do imaging with all sorts of these radiation, then combine the unique contrast they get from each of the different modalities. And exactly, so, and, and also if you look on the, the chat box, so this is what I, what I thought indeed, uh, so you're working more for the, for ISIS, so in terms of the neutron source there, so they're producing as well beam of neutron for users experiment, and they are mainly used for the spectroscopy technique, so not for the radiography, so not for the, the imaging, indeed. And in HAL, you have as well there for the, um, the muon as well, so for the, the mice experiment, for instance, so develop those type of uh, know-how. So potentially, is there, well, that's very good. So is there, um, I don't know if can I, do you have the, um, the audio? Is it possible for you to explain a little bit in ISIS? how all of those things are ongoing with the neutron beam. And maybe if you know more as well for the, the muon, what is ongoing with the, the mice or was. It doesn't look easy to, to, to have the voice. Huh? Yeah, so, 
So sorry. So I think uh, again, I'm trying to to speak, but indeed, even last time it was difficult. So what we'll do, Fabien, we can we can as well try to check uh, with uh, what those uh, muons they are or from the piece so they are developing in the in in Halle, so in Rutherford Lab in UK. So how it could be potentially uh, possible to answer as well those specific questions. So no, okay. no problem. Facebook, I have, uh -huh. I have, yes, Facebook, I have, I have get a good answer of. Professor Epley, Epley B. Thanks, thanks. Very good, thank you. Thanks a lot, Robin. Voilà. And you have as well some more answers there. So for the muon. Hmm. So that I use typically for studying the electronic properties and also for uh, the elemental analysis of samples. Good. Yeah, there are also with neutrons, I mean, some uh, several applications that I didn't show in this presentation now that you say elemental analysis. You can also, if you have access to very high energy neutrons, uh, you can use um, uh, absorption um, there and also get uh, elemental, you get like characteristic dips in your transmission spectrum uh, due to, and it's called resonance spectroscopy. So there are other methods that you can can exploit, um, and also on the ISS neutron source, that's something that is heavily uh, being done and, and being exploited. Yeah, very good. And and as well, so it, it will be interesting, Fabien, for you to follow next uh, week. So we'll have as well the presentation from Valentina uh, Santoro, who will present as well more this high energy physics aspect uh, from neutron and how at the ESS as well, uh, we could uh, potentially use as well some beam line for, for that dedication. And maybe there we could think in terms of, um, yeah, having a, a bit more of um, characterization on, on how we are using neutron for that aspect that uh, also Robin presented more focusing on material analysis rather than for the, the fundamental physics. Because indeed our students in the ESP are more dedicated to fundamental physics. So. Thanks, yeah, we are just really exploiting the <laughs> that type of physics for looking into our materials and processes. Mm -hmm. This is uh, yeah quite interesting to have this uh, applied physics. So and and material. This is also what is interesting because it's uh, not only for life science and there is I mean, soft matter, but as well with the 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 hard matter some important development as well to be developed. So Odin is supposed to be available when? I, the Odin imaging beamline will be one of the first three uh, beamlines. So um, this beam on target in 23 uh, right now as a, as a plan. So it will be definitely one of the first beamlines when we have beam on target uh, to be available and then to be also become available in the user program. And then we have a dedicated diffractometer. Dream will be one of the first three and uh, small angle scattering machine. Loki is supposed to be part of the first three instruments. Mm -hmm. And, then... and uh, we don't see, I mean, of course, we, we see some challenge, but uh, at least the technique that you are developing will be directly implemented. So... Very good. So, any more questions? So, or otherwise, so I think it's uh, we we have um, as well your email, so Robin. So it's it's really useful to have as well the presentation, the slide that I now uploaded as well on the on the Indico page, and then I will put as well so the recording so that uh, so our other colleagues and students can uh, access it uh, uh, later on, and if there are more questions, so anybody can contact. Uh, so Robbie, myself. And please really do, just don't be, be shy, just uh, send mm. an email. Um, and if you have some ideas um, to, to discuss them, um, think outside the box. Um, that's when the interesting stuff can, can happen. I definitely agree with that. So please do, and then uh, we can uh, follow up on that as well next uh, Tuesday, so same way, so at uh, at 3.30 CE time, or the right 2.30 your time, and then getting as well 
more into the um, connection as well with the high energy physics world. So back to finishing this course and uh, wrapping up as well with uh, the interest as well from photon and neutron to change and to unravel the mystery of the universe. Okay, so thank you very much, Robin. So greatly appreciate it. And then we'll have uh, certainly some uh, potential follow-up question that we will address with you later. Thanks a lot, Christine. And thank thanks you. to everyone uh, listening and have a good day. Have a good day, Prof. Goodbye. Thanks. Thank you Bye -bye. very much.